Some no. things we can't record, though. I'm, I'm just saying, like, the idea of sticking me up here, it's just not good. Actually, you I, know I, what? I, it worked out well. Yeah. I like it. It worked out well. No, and because he was like, well, he's like, we're the guest talk. <laughs> Well, like, it's oh here's my the, God, take here's the reason. I want to sit over there and pick my nose. It's not hard. Let me then, do what I'm good at. Okay. Well, then stop crying about not being on camera all the time. But that's fun too. But it's not fun for everybody else. You need to, again, read the audience, read the room, and realize when your jokes are inappropriate. How are my jokes inappropriate? Because you're hurting my feelings. By making me feel like I'm sticking you behind the camera because okay, well, I don't like you. Well, pause the sh- pause the recording real quick. Let me go get some Tylenol for your hurt butt. Wouldn't that be preparation H? Yeah, Tylenol. No, hurt. I thought you were a medic. Tylenol wouldn't help that. No, I, I'm just an ambulance driver. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Washdown Podcast. I'm a drunk taxi. <laughs> Too many feelings. I'm a facilitator. Of intoxicated movements around the city. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, you want to go to that hospital that's closer to your house? Hop on in. <laughs> Welcome to the Washdown Podcast. Welcome. I'm your host, Jeremy Green. And I'm salty. <laughs> <laughs> With me, my co-host, Chris Nelson. I'm the silent partner. And Captain Complaint. <laughs> Whoa. You cannot bestow yes. that name on somebody else. Just, dude, that is your is name. It, is it not <laughs> apropos? That is your name. No, I'm, I, I'm bequeathing I it, it to, to you. him. You can't. I gave it to you. Well, if it's mine. It's not a wedding gift that you can re-gift, all right? Yes, it is. No, it's, it's not. Totally. You can re-gift a nickname. No, you can't. Not, uh, I don't you, know. Okay, leave leave your suggestions in the comments if you think you can re-gift a nickname or not. I think you got to be you dead to do complaint. that. <laughs> <laughs> and RJ. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't forget about that one. Reaching back about <laughs> 10 years for that one. I guess a little more than 10 years. <laughs> well. That was at the grocery store, too. You're just jealous. That's all it is. Because our got? captain liked me more. I don't think he did. I don't what think he liked me What did you do for your, anybody to like Jeremy more than you? He didn't. That's on you. No, Nelson would get called at home about stuff that me and the other firefighter did or didn't do. I got yelled at. Yeah, and get yelled at. Like, I'm on this day. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. You're taking the next detail. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Building character. That's he what did. he's doing. He, he, he did build some character. <laughs> and some thick skin. Hey. I still hate Jeremy. Yeah, we're still, air quotes, friends. Hey. Everybody's was, gotta have at least one. I'm just here so I won't get fined. No, we're just a great martial lunch. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Are we getting paid? Well, you're getting paid. There ain't nobody getting paid. All I'm saying is we've made like some money on this so far, and I have yet to see any of it. Yeah, uh, if you would like to look at uh we've what money. we what we've made. The I'm last s- I checked it was a dollar thirteen. I'm just saying I thought we were profit sharing. Never mind. Well, I mean, I, I didn't. See, yeah. I, I didn't sign up to get paid. I guess I misread that in my contract. That's my fault. You got a contract? I got voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Had to give him a shoe deal. <laughs> That's terrible. It's a shitty deal. Yeah, That's a it's a terrible deal. deal. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, like I told the guys, <laughs> like I told one of the guys on the softball team, is I traded you to Cedar Rapids for a washing machine and a pack of Twizzlers. <laughs> And they got the raw end of the deal. <laughs> what kind of Twizzlers? Hang on. <laughs> well, cherry, of course. The peel ones? Uh, you know what? I really don't like those. I don't See, like I don't the, have the texture. I don't have the, don't have the patience. Really? I, I like, like the, the peel thing. ones better. I mean, I still eat it like a regular Twizzlers, but I like the taste yeah. better. I like the, the bites. The t- you know, the short. They're not bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those I like. So. No, I'm hungry. I want some candy. Let's see if we can work that in our next contract. Yeah. Have snacks. Yeah, snacks. Well, we need to have Dana, Dana on again. She'll bring us donuts again. I do like Ooh, donuts. Yeah. <laughs> Dana, are you watching? We need you back, honey. Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I guess today we're going to talk about me and why we started the podcast. The original Captain Complaint. The original Captain Complaint. I really probably hey, can't even you, say the original. Can you put that Toby Key song in there? I want to talk about me. 
Or do you probably, want to say it It's probably copyrighted. Probably. Oh, we'll give him a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> he'd be okay with that. He'd, he'd be behind, I guarantee you, if he knew about this, he'd be behind it. Because he's that guy. He it may be. Come I, on, Toby. I don't know. Need your help, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Are you watching? <laughs> yeah. Somehow, I think this is what Toby's doing on his tour bus right now is is watching the Washdown podcast. Absolutely. Well, it'd be great if he was. That'd be so cool. I, st- I still like Toby Keith. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about you. All right. And why we started the podcast or why it's important, at least to me. Um, so basically, we'll just start at the beginning. Grew up in a small town in Louisiana. Insert jokes now. Oh, no. Look, come later. They speak for oh. themselves. It's oh. Louisiana. Do you have to say a joke? Yeah. Well, especially. You, you inserted I mean, the, you guys always do. You inserted the joke by saying Louisiana, but continue. Okay. I, I've been there. He took me there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it, was, it was pretty nice. I yeah. did like I like Louisiana. It was a beautiful he, state. He ate crawfish and was like, I don't want to go back. Yeah, I was good with staying there in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Think about it, crawfish, beer. When you were sober, you shot guns. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, went to went to a small college. Uh, well, in you're Iowa. educated. Yes, oh. I, I am. He didn't finish. I did ah. not finish. Ah. <laughs> I did. So I went to college uh, and majored in basketball, um, which, you know, doesn't work out so well whenever you get hurt and then have a disagreement with the coach. And because you know everything, you decide it's a great idea to quit, move down to a town that you basically know nobody at except for the girl you're dating, get married. Idiot. Yeah. Get married because you think it's a good idea. Uh, get on the fire department because, hey, I hate sitting in a cubicle. I want to do something active. My dad was a volunteer fireman. I got to do a little stuff, you know, back home. You know, grass fires, forest fires, that kind of stuff. Um, said, hey, sounds cool. One of the people that I was working with at the time, her husband was on the fire department. She's like, hey, they're hiring. You should apply. So I applied, um, got very fortunate, um, didn't know it until afterwards. Um, but apparently when you apply the first time you typically used to not get on, it would take three or four times applying. I applied once. Yeah. Which a lot of guys in our hiring process, mm-hmm. you know, guys in our class, it was a one time. Yeah. So they hired a ton of people, got on, everything was good. Then I got divorced. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> that was good. It, I mean, <laughs> but, you know, it, it was. Yeah, it was. Lie. I won't sugarcoat that one. Yeah, that was probably. <clears throat> we were two different people. So, and I'll take, you know, my share of responsibility. I wasn't the same person that I was whenever we got married and probably got married for the wrong reasons. Um, Tax credit. Yeah, there you go. Um, and, you know, everything was great for a little while, um, I would say. Um, growing up, you know, I had little deal with alcohol in high school, um, especially after basketball ended my senior year because I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with my life. I knew I would probably go to college. I looked into the military, was thinking very seriously about it. And I won't say that my dad talked me out of it, but he pushed me in the direction of going to school. Um, like I said, just typical high school stuff, you know, get drunk on the weekends, whatever. And I really didn't drink whenever I got on the job. It wasn't until later that it kind of started to kind of spin out of control. And I had, you know, probably a two or three month, I don't don't know what you would call it, an episode, whatever, of just really drinking real heavy and I kind of pulled myself out of it 
got talked to about how I was being a jackass at work. This or side hand? Um, it was it was pretty much this way. Yeah, was, okay. So um, well, you wouldn't find to work with. No, we'd, I was. We'd be at work. You'd be hungover. Yep. You could smell it. Of course, the other two firefighters over there, you can smell it on them too. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were all extremely young. Yeah. We we were all young. We were all just Everybody going singing. out. Yeah. And and that's how we coped with everything because that was a culture, you know. And I didn't know any different. Um, and as far as like any type of mental health or resiliency or anything like that, I had no clue. You know, I grew up in a small town where, and, and I'm not going to say small towns are like that, but it's just not something that they're limited in what they have to offer. Yeah. It, it just wasn't in my world. You know, it wasn't it's, something I had experience with like depression or, you know, PTSD. Well, life is different in a small town than it is yeah. in a big city. Yeah. So, um, that was when you were dating yeah. the one girl. Yeah. And that didn't end well, and, no, and that's drink, how I handled it. Drinking again, had to pull him back out of that. Yeah. That was after you bought the house. Because um, you were doing it at the house, no, too. No, that was, that was before I bought the house. After I bought the house, I started drinking again and then pulled myself out of it. And you're talking blind shut, lights off, just the TV. Yeah. In the middle of the day. Yeah. Well... I mean, if we're going to talk I, about it, we're going to yeah, talk about it. Yeah. No, and and I did for a little while. And it, it was it was beer, and then it was heavier beers, expensive beers, like the $10 a bottle beer. Ooh. And then to the whiskey. Yeah. Well, the whiskey didn't start until after I found out that I had gout. Yeah. And that's that's later on. But um, met Rachel, cleaned up my act, kind of. Um, Did you clean up your act or clean up your front? I cleaned up the outside. Nothing was fixed. I mean, I was still, and I'm not going to claim that I had PTSD or any of that. I'm not going to do that. What I will tell you is I had very bad insomnia. I fought in my sleep. Um, I relived calls over and over again, just bad shit, you know? Um, and the worst for me were, and still are, I just, I can handle them now a little bit better, but the kid calls, I've run far too many, um, dead babies, um, preventable, you know? And it really just, they still get to me and I was still dealing with that. And my way of dealing with crap was to drink, um, text old girlfriends, that kind of shit. I have a question for you, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, you referenced like the, the dead kids call and then you said a lot of it was preventable. Mm -hmm. What was it that stayed with you? Was it the sight sound? Smell, or was it the lack of whatever that led to the situation that would almost anger you? Like, what, what was it that stayed? Or was it a combination of all of them? Um, so for me, and I know for a lot of people, like, the smell stays, you know? And there are certain calls where that, that holds true. Um, but for the kid calls, for me, it's the visual. And, you know, I could see it. Like I was right there. Um, I don't want to get too into detail about it, but I had about a year on, um, maybe a little bit more whenever I ran my first dead kid and the kid wasn't dead yet. Um, and it was a totally preventable situation where dad was passed out. And big brother, who was about four, maybe, was trying to feed the baby. And it was dry baby powder and was just pushing it into his mouth. Well, of course, it lodged like 
concrete in his throat and the baby basically choked to death. And I mean, the thing that sticks with me vividly from that call is the fact that whenever we got there, dad was just kind of standing out in the front yard and then tried to lie about it. And I think that, you know, that aided me for a long time of how could you let this happen? You know, and then also the, how did we not save that kid? You know, because that's what we do. And again, I was, I had a year on the job. I'm like, okay, we got this. This is easy. No, it's not easy. Especially when, you know, you don't know how long the baby's been. I mean, he was blue. So, I mean, he still had a little bit of a pulse, but I mean, it was, he was too far gone by that point for us to realistically do anything. And, you know, we went back to the station after that and I'll never forget, I had this salty old driver and, but he wasn't like the salty old drivers that you think, you know, like those, oh, suck it up, load it. Like he actually came over and checked on me. He's like, Hey, how you doing? That was a bad call. And I pulled the, oh, I'm good. Yeah, it sucked, but yeah, it's all good. No, it wasn't all good. And that call and other calls like it through the years stayed with me. And I think the tipping point for me came whenever my dad passed. Um, He had a stroke while he was at work. He worked on an offshore oil rig. So they had to life flight him from the oil rig to New Orleans. Uh, My stepmom called me. Of course freaking out and so I drop everything throw some clothes in a bag into my truck drive down there that's not a short drive (laughs) and driving through Arkansas at 2 (laughs) a.m. sucks by the way especially when your GPS keeps telling you you make a U-turn or go this way no there's no road that way (laughs) Um, so, but I made it down there and, you know, it's the next day or whatever. And he was still tubed and there was still some hope, you know, they're like, yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty major. They had already done the surgery and all of that stuff to get rid of the clot. And, um, but they didn't know how long he was down either. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. I thought last time we talked about it, um, he worked that 12 hour shift and he was, yeah, he was actually with people. So he was on the bridge and was talking to, I can't remember what the guy's title is or whatever, but he was talking to somebody. Okay. And then he, I guess he sat down in his chair or something. And cause I actually talked to the guy at the funeral and he looked at the guy and you the guy said that you could tell he was trying to say something, but he couldn't like speak Mm -hmm. and then kind of went out. So that's whenever they called for the helicopter and all that stuff. Yeah. I didn't know that part. Yeah. So, um, went down to the hospital, was there for a little while. He seemed to be doing better. So they pulled the tube out. Um, he was able to kind of get his name out whenever they would ask him his name and stuff. And it seemed like he was on the upswing. So, you know, with a situation like that of how long that can take for them to be in ICU, then get moved to a room, do physical therapy, rehab, all of that. Yeah. It's a, it's a long, long process. Well, I got to work. I have a wife, I have bills, I have, you know, stuff going on. So had the conversation with my mother-in-law of, Hey, I'm going to go back home, go back to work. And then in a couple of weeks, I'll come down again, you know, cause how our schedule works every ninth day, we get what's called an end day. And so that's five days off. 
so I can drive down there, be there a couple days, come back. And that was my plan. I was going to do that until, you know, he could get home. I don't think I'd been back for two days when she called me again and he started crashing. So I was like, what the hell? So threw stuff in the truck again, loaded up, started heading down. And like, we're having all these conversations. I'm talking to her on the phone on the way down there. I'm talking to the hospitalist and they're talking about end of life stuff. And I'm freaking out, you know, I'm driving through Arkansas, through the mountains, cell services, very spotty. So like I'm having a conversation and then nothing. So then I got to wait and get to the next town or whatever. And then I can call back then have a little bit more of a conversation and then get cut off again, cut off again, cut off again. So right about the time that I got down to Shreveport, which is still a long way away, you know, it's still three and a half, four hours out of new Orleans. Um, she called and said they were going to try one more thing that, because he wasn't like his kidney function was down. Um, but one of the nurses was like, you know, we need to check him for a bladder infection or a UTI or something like that. So they did and ended up, he had a whole bunch of sediment and stuff in his bladder and that was what was making him sick. Well, they drained all of that out and he started bouncing back. So by the time I get there at 2 a.m., He's awake. He's alert. He's doing better. Same process. He's doing better, doing better, doing better. Um, you know, whenever I first went down there, they got him out of bed. He was able to kind of, he stand up a little bit with assistance. Um, the second time I went down there, he couldn't do that. Again, while I was down there, you know, the doctors were talking, Hey, we need to make a decision, you know, because this is what happens. And I'm like, no, that's not what happens. He's going to make it, you know, he's tough old dude. He's been through a lot, you know, and that's not how it worked out. Even with your time, even little enough on the job already, you had kind of, I'm, I'm sure, in the city on this job, it doesn't take long to experience the reality of situations. So how yeah. did you separate the reality from what you wanted? Well, or did you? Um, so here's the deal. And that it kind of plays into what happened after. And I'll explain that. Um, so basically what happens is I went down there, I came back to kind of shorten it up a little bit, came back again, two days, called me. He's not doing good. Those stuff in the truck, head back down, make it about two hours. They call he's passed. Um, so then, you know, went to the funeral and all that stuff. Then. So, you would think, right, that I would know. Like you said, I've been on the job. I had been on for, what, 15 years at that point? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Um, so you would think that I would have seen that and known, you know. Basically, for me, there was a total separation, Right. And I don't know if it was a, I was living at that point, two separate people. Basically I was this guy that everybody sees. And then I was this guy who, you know, I kept to myself and did the things that I was doing. Um, it all came to a head. Uh, I cheated on my wife, you know, and she found out about it. So 
So I ended up setting in our bedroom floor. Had one gun in my hand. She took away from me. Then I got my other gun out and she took that away from me. So, yeah, that's where I ended up. And, you know, after he passed, I had been, hadn't been, I'd been drinking. Um, and it had been slowly ramping up again. When he passed, it totally took over, took over. And like, cause I, I drove home two hours. Well, actually it was closer to three hours after I got that phone call by myself, just stuck in my head of what a piece of shit I was. I wasn't there. I didn't make it. Why did I leave? I was a failure, a terrible son. And the very first thing that I did whenever I got home was pour a drink. And then I did what I had done for basically my whole life is I took it, I stuck it in my box and just buried it. All of those emotions, all of those feelings. But you didn't know your box was already full. Oh, that box had been so full for so long, dude. Um, That, That last event was your tipping point. Yeah. You just didn't know it yet. Yeah. And which led to me really spinning out of control. And luckily for me, my wife was there to save my life. And I went into treatment. Uh, She was able to call Chris and have him come over and sit with me. Um, Took me down to treatment that day. I went inpatient. And... That kind of has led us up to this point. So, questions, comments? <laughs> so, back to the part where you said you're from Louisiana. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not being there for your dad and thinking you're a failure was absolutely wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, I you know, learned just, that. You, yeah, you, every, you learn it eventually. Yeah. And it's hard to accept because yeah. everybody feels like they should be there. At the exact moment. But yeah. in reality, that's damn near impossible for all of us. Jeremy, I'll ask mm-hmm. you this. And don't get mad at me for asking it. Okay. Do you think your work with this podcast and your advocacy for mental health awareness and others mm-hmm. is a 180 swing or do you still think you're compensating for something that has yet to be addressed? Um, that's a good question. I know. That's what I ask good questions. Well, that's debatable. He got one yeah, so far. He got one so far. <laughs> and what no, this, really good this will be though. episode 23. Um, <laughs> no, I think so. So the treatment program that I went into um, was specifically tailored for military and first responders, police, fire, EMS. And, you know, I was in the culture and of the mindset of the suck it up, you know, and by being able to go through that program specifically, kind of opened my eyes to exactly what, like how big the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm the type of person that, and the reason that I got on the fire department is I want to help people, you know? And we've kind of talked about that before with like the whole peer support thing and, you know, being able to help our own, you know, and how it just kind of, it's a little bit extra, a little bit more, and I don't want to say rewarding because our job is rewarding, but 
maybe it just means a little bit more to me. And honestly, if I can keep one person from going down the path that I went down and having to get to the point that I got to, because it's only by the grace of God and my wife being there that I am still alive today. Those are the only two things. Not everybody has that. You know, not everybody has the wife that's going to jump on top of you and wrestle a gun away from you. And she's half your size. She kicked your ass. Yeah. I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, in that moment, not everybody's going to have that. Not have somebody around that's going to be able to do that or that will do that. Or just even have somebody around. So I'll ask you this. Are you prepared to fail at that? Um, I think it's inevitable. But are you prepared for it? Prepared how? To not go back to the same Jeremy you were when you failed before. I guess I don't. I think that's part oh. of the reason for the podcast. So, yeah, I think Jeremy's done a 180 in his mental health. And I think part of the reason for this podcast. And you know, like you were there a lot for this journey. I wasn't. So. Yeah. So, I mean, he's completely flipped. The, the treatment program worked phenomenally for him. The work he's put in since then is so he doesn't revert back. Part of the reason for the podcast is one to help people. And I think that's the main reason, but it's also <clears throat> therapeutic to be able to talk about it and keep it at the forefront of your mind. That way you never stop working for that goal to get better. Because if you stop working, we all know what's going to happen. We're going to start drinking again to do excess. You're going to start making bad decisions. You're going to start going down that slippery rabbit hole. And this way you're not going to put your foot in that or the grease to get you going. All right. So, yeah, I think he answered your question yeah, just uh, about yeah. as good as I could. And, I better, you know, I've, I've had the same <laughs> That's question. What I do. I've had the same conversations with Rachel and, you know, it's not uncommon for people to backslide and revert back and all of that stuff. And the one thing that I think helps me more than anything else is the relationship that I have with her. And the fact that I came so close to destroying all of that, of the one thing in my life that was good and that I did want, I'm not going to take that risk again. And I know that it's not, I can't just say, okay, well, I'm going to stay sober for her or I'm not going to do those things for her. That's not enough. Well, and I mean, no matter too, that's, it's not that you guys would ever get divorced or anything, but like you'll always be here for you. Jeremy's not going anywhere until Jeremy decides not to be here. Yeah. Anything can happen to Rachel. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, I mean, you can't that's make just your life. You can't make your commitments based on something that isn't guaranteed. Yeah. And, She's still a driving force, though, because of what she does for a living, and she can – damn, hair in my mouth. <clears throat> well, but, the so the thing is for me, like I said, is you can't – look, I've got friends that have done it and all that. They get sober for somebody else, or, you know, I'm going to be sober for my kid, or I'm going to do – that's not enough. It's not a good enough reason – like to do it for somebody else, you have to do it for yourself. And the big difference between Jeremy now and Jeremy then, Jeremy now likes himself. I like who I am now. You know, I don't have the shame and the guilt. Yeah, I know you're smiling, but Sorry, I don't. That makes one of you. Okay, I'm moving on. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't have all that stuff in my closet. I don't have the shame and the guilt and the hiding that I had then. So why would I, and this is, you know, my way of thinking, why would I want to go back to that, to the stress and all the energy put into so doing how much, all how that much more ener- in, How much more energy did you spend maintaining that lifestyle? Oh, versus dude. <laughs> no. I mean, it's exhausting. It really is. And I mean, especially, you know, like just the drinking alone, you know, I would be out 
working on the Jeep or the physical the, toll, the financial toll. Yeah. But. I mean, I was spending, so what's a handle of whiskey, you know, 50 bucks, the stuff that I was drinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so on top or bottom shelf. Yeah. Well, Bush mills. In the middle of the road. Yeah. Middle of the road. I liked it. Whatever. Anyway, whenever you're talking about you're drinking one of those in two days, you're going through two, three, four a week. Yeah. It gets expensive. Yeah. Just the toll drinking alone takes on your yeah. body. Hurting like, dude, coming to the, and coming you guys are going to, you guys are both going to laugh because, well, you've got no hair left and I don't know, maybe you can grow hair. Maybe you can't. I can grow hair. It's just like Hulk Hogan. Whenever, whenever I stopped drinking, like I was pretty much going bald. And whenever I stopped, my hair grew back. I didn't know you could be any uglier, but I guess so. So what other other, other physical changes did you see? Um, I have less gray hair. My joints don't hurt as bad. It doesn't hurt for me to get out of bed in the morning as much as it did. I mean, it still does because I got some mileage. Um, has being friends with me brought back any of your gray hair? Um, no, because you don't bother me, Moran. Oh, damn it, I'm not I'm I just look at enough. you. <laughs> I just look at you as a millennial and just accept that. Listen, you know, listen, I can't. listen, listen. <laughs> Sounds listen. like fighting words yeah. now. I can't change. Positive recording. I've got, the, <laughs> I've got the. I've got the serenity to know the things that I can't change. <laughs> that was the time you should have used the R word on him. <laughs> Which R word? Oh, racist. I'll say it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Because no. he attacked you. Oh, that is true. I attacked the white half of you. I feel offended. Wow. What? Wow. I'm not a racist. I'm offended for him. He's not a racist. He has a color TV. <laughs> He's got two. <laughs> By the way. I do have two. I got a giant. I put that one up in the bedroom. It's awesome. I got a, like an 80 inch TV in the living room. Did now. you hang it up? Really? Yeah. Actually, it's not 80. It's like 72 or something. I'm still not going to watch Packers games. I don't watch Packers games either. Terrible fan. Your boy's gone. He wants out. I don't blame him. I'd want out too. Don't commit to winning. So let's talk about your mental health once yeah. you have a shitty quarterback again <laughs> for the Packers. Hey, man, I suffered through the 80s just fine. <laughs> We're going to be back on here like a year. Well, after Ed Rogers left, I kind of relapsed. <laughs> Went through some hard times, but then we signed that one guy. And, you know. uh, what's going to get him is Duke basketball, not making the tournament <laughs> two years in a row. Man, that was painful. We're going to send him into real life. He's going to be like, I can't. <laughs> Screw you guys. I'm going home. Man, how, oh, how, how was it like to watch Duke lose on that 72-inch TV? <laughs> he didn't watch it. I, 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 I it. did not. I have not watched. Uh, I've watched more Duke games in the last year than he's watched in the last 10 years. And I'm not a Duke fan. Well, that very well could be true. I will not deny. I tend to not watch the regular season college basketball. I will watch come like conference tournament time. And some of that is my own fault of not paying attention to when they're on, but I don't pay attention to when they're on. Like I've got other stuff, you know, like watching sports anymore for me, like for a long time, it was like Sundays. I'm watching football all day long. Don't bother me. It's just another way of being a dick, you know. No, Saturdays are my day. That's my football day. Saturdays are for the boys. So. And then Sunday. But also, don't talk to me on Sundays either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, see, I still watch or, on Sundays. Or big Mondays. I always say I'm never going to watch football anymore, and I sit there and watch it every game. I'm like, yep, still watching. Yeah. <laughs> And well, then Big Monday. I haven't. So Tuesday, Wednesday. You know what? Congratulations <laughs> on following through better than a weekend. Because every time yeah. I'm like, stupid NFL. I hate that. And then I'm like, well, still watch watching NFL. <laughs> still watching, dude. It, it frees up so much time for activities. Well, then Man, Sunday. Did you build your bunk bed yet? Um, no, but I did karate in my garage the other day. Okay. Ooh, yeah. um, Practice your drumming. My guitar. Yeah. But no. So Sundays, Rachel's pretty much her only day off. So whenever I'm not at the station, that's You're kind working of working for Rachel. Got it. Yeah. Well, it's a day that we could spend together. You Doing know. stuff for her. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> we know how, we know how Dude, marriage works. Come on. Don't. She's going to watch this and be like, James is an asshole. 
No, she's going to watch this and be like, oh, I could get more productivity out of him on Sundays. <laughs> yeah. Hmm, that's pretty, what she's going to do. Pretty sure she I'm going to get a text message about... and I'm like, you're an asshole. And I'm like, oh, sorry. And yeah. Rachel's going to send me a text that says, hey, thanks. Yeah. We've optimized our productivity around the home. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to have a chart made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to get a chore chart. Rachel, make a chore oh, chart, please. Gold make stars a chore are coming chart. out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to anything he says. <laughs> I'm going to text her here in a minute. Hell yeah. Sure, <laughs> chart. Make sure you watch this one. We gave you lots of great ideas. <laughs> you know that Jeep? It's gone. Oh, well, I'm trying to get that sold anyway. Is that is that one of your chores on your chore chart? Um, Have you been instructed to sell the Jeep? It, it's on my own chore chart. No, I just came to the realization that, you know, I don't need it. Decorate this room and like hang stuff up. No, but. Jeremy's chore chart. It's going on the wall. Hopefully <laughs> by the end of the summer, maybe sooner, we will be in a new house, and that's where we'll be moving the studio to. You're so excited. And don't remember. And remember, I, I bought a table saw, and I've already used it. And it's awesome. That can be in the background, too, next to Jeremy's short chart. <laughs> no, I'm just saying for when we built this studio. Oh, we, we got yeah. Oh. Yep, we will. And a nail gun, a framing nailer, is on my list to buy. So oh, give me an excuse to buy. One. Good lord! I'll, I'll help build it, but it's going to leak if you get me on the job. It's it's interior room. Yeah. It is all it will be. If it leaks, we got a problem. Yeah, we got Dust a big don't problem. Don't have me work on it. <laughs> all right, he, he's going to be the gopher. Yeah, yeah. Grab this, okay? Hey, man, we need you to go to Home Depot. Yeah, it's my seventh trip in two hours. I know. Yeah, and you still haven't yeah. gotten anything right that we've asked <laughs> yeah. you. Well, yeah. I've tried. <laughs> Here's pictures. Give it to the guy that works there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, you laugh, but that's actually happened to me. Like it, so, no, dude. Dude, you know, it's easier to get to pull the picture of what you need and just text that to. Hi, can I help going. you? Yeah, yeah, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. But, you're not wrong. It's all about efficiency. Because yeah. I don't want to make 17 trips to Home Depot on a Saturday. No. Or one, I don't want to make one, one or, trip. And it's one never, trip. And it's never one trip. Well, yeah, no, I can't say anything. Although else. I did put that new light in the garage. And it only took me 30 minutes. And I wired it correctly. It was awesome. And you didn't shock yourself? And I was by myself, so I had to keep running up and down the stairs, turn the power on and off. <laughs> Maybe you should have called somebody. No, he needed the workout. <laughs> Easy there, Daryl. Pot, kettle. That was payback from the last episode. It's not my fault. You're almost. You're almost. Oh hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm almost a damn. <laughs> Let's be honest. Oh, you know, which we me, need it to does do. get me out of things, especially like yeah, their day at the station. They're like, "Hey, we need somebody to climb up on this ladder," and I'm like, "Oh, sorry." You don't want the fat guy going. <laughs> I can't we fit in need that hole. to we need to sit down and have a serious conversation about physical fitness. Why you gotta be that way? And Does it longevity. Pizza? No. Well, that, that's stupid. I don't want to be a part of it. Then. So I, I've been. I lost, re- I lost five pounds so in the last two days. Just give running me, up and down the stairs. Give no. me a minute. Be sick. Um. So I'm reading this book. Um. By Stop Tanya Glenn. Books, man. I, I know it's terrible. I, be, be like Chris, watch movies. Yeah, like the new Tom Clancy movie. They haven't made movies. You can about, you can eat while you watch movies. Anyway, it's great. Michael B. Jordan, man, come on. Yeah, I know. I've seen, seen it. it. It's it awesome. not that great. It was good. I liked it. It was okay. It could he, have been better, but it just, was good. Yeah, he needs a like a range of emotion instead of just angry all the time. Why wow, he does angry so well? He does angry well, but after seven movies, yeah, it's like Will Ferrell. He's the same guy every movie. Yeah, no. that's Stop. why. That's why you have that role. Like, hey, we need an anger guy for this role. Yeah. Get him. So I thought he did emotional very well. Anyway, he did that one Lifetime movie with Kristen Wiig that was actually not bad. I'm yeah. reading this book by Tanya Glenn called "Smashing the Stigma." She's a very well known and reputable therapist down in Texas that works with a lot of fire departments, police departments, and all that stuff. And in pretty much every book that. I've read by her. She talks about the importance of the, your physical fitness on your mental fitness. So whenever your body's hurting, when you're producing too many, you know, chemicals or whatever, and you're out of shape, it takes a toll on your mental health as well. 
I'm interested in because, the, which came first, the chicken or the egg in that. Well, I, I've, there's been times that I've been through the depression where it's just like, I don't want to get out of bed. Yeah. And so she, the physical fitness suffers. Yeah. And she talks about that. And it's one of those things, especially with depression, how it can just cycle and snowball, you know. Um, but when you when you go work out and you have a physical fitness exercise and I'm not saying everybody needs to go be a freaking bodybuilder. I'm not a bodybuilder. That's for sure. Yeah. No, I'm uh, six foot two and 190 pounds soaking wet. So we're talking about your chicken legs. Hey, you leave my legs alone, man. I do leg day every third day. I do. No, he doesn't. Okay, you have a jacked up knee like I've got, and you'll see how much weight you're pushing around. Excuses. It's not excuses. Excuses. I work around I have two my limitations. Knees. And a shoulder. So, you a little Michael B. Jordan on right now. with doing those workouts, <laughs> with going, getting the sweat in, and putting that effort in, it produces, your brain starts producing chemicals that help with depression, um, it, with everything. And it just kind of... It helps you rebalance. Curious because I haven't read the book. Does she talk about when that goes too far to becoming an addiction? Um, not really. She hasn't really, at least what I've read, she hasn't talked about it. I, um, I am curious where that fine line is between like staying physically. Well, did, did you fit uh, Because you weren't versus, here for that episode. That yeah, he shot. was. With Damon. Sure yeah, he was here. Were you here for that one? Yeah, because he made a joke about his Miami Dolphins shirt. Oh, yeah. It's all run together. Freaking yeah. Dolphins. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, no. It's so. Look, too much of a good thing is too much, and anything there can be too much of. So if you're, you know, you're spending too much time at the gym, you know, you get to the point where, and that people kind of need to realize this is you can overtrain, you can break your muscles down too far, you can injure yourself, and then try to train through an injury. Well, you can't. Your body has to heal just like your mind has to heal. And it's a process. And that goes back to the whole hard work thing we were talking about earlier. People don't want to put in the hard work. Or they think one way of, well, I'm just going to be tough and I'm going to push through. All right, well, where does that get you? Being tough and pushing through is good for some things maybe. And it'll get you a little ways. But paying attention, listening to your body, checking in on how your mental health is doing is going to take you so much further and you're going to be so much happier going forward with the rest of your life because you can break yourself down to the point where like Ronnie Coleman, you know, what is eight time Mr. Olympia? Mm-hmm. He's basically in a wheelchair because I'm going to push through. Okay. Well, you've crushed like seven vertebrae in your back. I'm going to push that wheelchair through the door now, son. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, he's, not much older than we are, really. No, he's in his 40s. Yeah, late 40s, early 50s, and can't walk because I got to do 800-pound squats. Well, listen to your body. Check in with your mental health. You know, and I think it comes I mean, you down to... You got to stop yawning, dude. Kill sorry. Me. Yeah, you, you need to be honest with yourself. And that was the thing for me is I was not honest with myself. I would lie to myself just like I lie to everybody else. I'm good. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Hey, you're not good. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Stupid voice of truth. <laughs> yeah. I reject your reality and insert my own. And, you know, I remember having conversations before everything happened with my wife. And she's like, well, how do you handle everything? And how do you function seeing all the stuff? I just do. It don't bother me. Oh, bullshit i'm a badass yeah throw the fucking flag you know i'm a gator no you're not i'm a baby gator i'm a baby gator <laughs> i'm a baby gator i'm like a caiman <laughs> one of the small ones spare me <laughs> where'd you go got flushed down the toilet <laughs> so but yeah i mean the importance of owning your shit checking in on yourself and being able to and willing to do the hard work and admitting stuff, I mean, that's the hardest thing of all is, you know, nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to be seen as weak. You know, nobody wants to say that they don't have all the answers. 
or that they're having a problem or whatever. And, you know, ultimately you're going to end up hurting your friends. You're going to hurt your family. Like we were talking in the last episode, the last thing that's going to suffer is your job, especially with us in our career field is because we're going to show up for work. Might be hung over, but we're still going to do our job. And by and large, the culture is, oh yeah, the dude's a drunk, but he shows up to work every Great day. Great fireman. Great fireman. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever said that about me, but no, I was there every I'll day. I'll say it about you. Jeremy's a great fireman. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, James. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was there every day, you know? it's I didn't call in sick because I was hungover. Fuck it, I'll go to work. Probably not the best thing to do, you know? But even, even when you were at work, you still alienated yourself. Oh, I absolutely did. In your bunk, on your computer, watching Netflix. Yep. Netflix. Not, engage, not engaging. Yeah. No, I did. And part of that was, I mean, obviously I was unhappy. Um, but I didn't want to engage. And I didn't feel like anybody wanted me to engage. So I was like, fuck you guys. You don't want me around. I'm going to fucking go to the bunk i'm gonna watch my netflix and if there's a call i'll be there otherwise me, it was all it was probably they don't want me around instead of being like why don't they want me around no yeah no because it's not my fault it, it could not have possibly been my fault yeah <laughs> it's never your fault ding, no ding, news alert yeah <laughs> That's the ticker that runs along the bottom. <laughs> if you think it's not your fault, but seven other people say it's your fault, maybe it's your fault. Stupid news. I'm not watching this channel <laughs> <Yeah>. anymore. <laughs> Screw that. Mainstream media is stupid. Well, that, that is, yeah, well that's yeah, true. Yeah. But yeah. But no, I mean, but that goes back to being honest with yourself, you know, and eventually having a friend that'll call you out. Say, hey, dude, you're being a douche. I have one one time long ago, believe it or not. I was actually I had really, a friend. I, was, I had a friend, <laughs> yeah. He thought he was wrong once, but then realized he wasn't, so. <laughs> I told myself I wasn't. Yeah, he's not I actually door, used to so be in, like, yeah. <laughs> fantastic shape, had abs. It was, it was I've awesome. seen the pictures. Yeah, it was You're a good-looking awesome. young man. Thank you. I had hair. Yeah, a lot of hair. What and happened? there were a lot of um, physical things I overcame to get there, like just pushing myself, getting better. There's a lot of mental things. Obviously, being a college athlete, there's a huge academic component there. There's a lot of mental work I had to, mental toughness I had to develop to get assignments done. It was, I, I was efficient in what I did. Getting on the fire department is not easier either. There's a lot of academics and mental work that go into it and, and physical work. And I've done a lot. Probably the hardest thing I've ever done was self-reflection post-divorce. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's still... It's not as intense now as it was initially. Uh, it, it's a continual process, but it fucking sucks. Uh, yeah. Wait till you get married again. No, not happening. Don't say I, that. We both said I that. I said that for years. So did yeah. Jeremy. For years. And then you meet the, you meet someone, you're like, holy shit. I did. It. I met my yeah. Rubicon, and then I met my Street Glide. And we <laughs> have a fantastic relationship. Except your Rubicon is always in the shot. shut up. <laughs> We're gonna see him on TLC. You know those people that you know why like, you can't. You know why you can't sex with his car. That's what we're gonna see him on. You know why you can't sell patches? Why is that? Because there has to be a new patches, and I know who it's gonna be. The yours. Yeah, yeah. and I don't want that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah well, super glue and duct tape fixes everything. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I find out about the wiring issue, but yeah. So, like what you said. The self-reflection is the hardest part. And that's something that, you know, in our culture is not very, it's becoming more so, but it's not encouraged. It's the just younger generations kind of bringing it in. Yeah. You know, some of the older guys that that refuse to do it are retiring. And the ones that are still here are like, maybe this isn't, they're starting to see a different way. Yeah. Look at some you've, you've got both sides of the aisle. You got guys that are starting to come around and guys that are staying hard line mm-hmm. of this is not, no, if this is, if you, if you get, you know, burned out or whatever, this just ain't the job for you. Well, no, maybe people aren't, you know, meant to run 
40 freaking calls and stay up for 48 hours straight. You know, you what, know? what I thought was interesting, Jeremy, was that not only like the, the first hard part was the self-reflection admitting it to myself mm-hmm. or just or folk, making myself give attention and focus to the thoughts and make sense of them to myself. The even harder part, I think, though, was acting on it, behaving accordingly. Like mm-hmm. you can, you know, you can, and I bet, I bet, Jeremy, if you're truly honest, when you were sitting back in your bunker on your laptop, you knew what the problem was. But did you actually act on it, or was it easier to just try and convince yourself again after you realized what it was? Because that, that, that's what I went through. I, well, I knew what the problem was, but then actually acting and behaving accordingly to what I knew I needed to change was different. So I think for the most part, for me is, um. I lied to myself to the point where I didn't know what the problem was. Like I truly believed it was not me, which I think ultimately led down the path that I went down is because, yeah, I wasn't willing to admit that I could be the problem. Like even to myself. And I mean, that's some pretty hardcore delusional you know but that's how I was and you know I had somebody tell me and it's funny I just remembered this popped into my head I was talking to somebody it was right about that time about promotional test and all of that stuff and they basically and somebody that I respect and they didn't say that I would make a bad captain <clears throat> Or a bad supervisor, um, like outright. Was it me? No. Okay. You weren't on the job back then. I, um, say, I, I said that when I found out you were going to get promoted. <laughs> yeah. But the words that came out of their mouth was uh, something along the lines of, well, the issue for you is that you're never wrong. That you're always right and it's always somebody else's fault. Did I say that? No. I'm pretty sure I've said that before. No, I'm too. pretty sure I said well, that too. I'm, I'm pretty sure you did, but, <laughs> but this came wrong. this came from someone I actually respected. Oh, I got it. Yeah, I quit. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. And you would think that hearing somebody say that to you would snap you out of it. <laughs> Fuck that guy. That's exactly the thought I had. I was like, I'm not like that. There's no way I could be like that. No, I was like that. Why'd you use the past tense? Dude. That's I'm not a, like that. That's a great question. I <laughs> am willing to admit whenever I'm wrong now. If I was ever wrong. See? You're going to struggle. <laughs> and I'm not going to come be your driver. <laughs> You're going to get somebody like me, and you're going to be so screwed. Or you might just get me. <laughs> well, I ain't worried about it. I have to come be his driver just so he doesn't choke somebody out or get fired. Dude. It doesn't so for the pe- choke him so out get for, fired. The, for the people that watch this that don't know us, they may take you seriously whenever you say some crap like that. With some poor young kid like, I don't want Mr. Green as a captain. <laughs> yeah. <no." laughs> That's their problem, not mine. Yeah. Well, it's my problem. It's, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, it's your problem, not mine. That's all. I like that better. Yeah. You're making it my problem. Your jokes are my problem. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it yep. is. <laughs> so, but I can't no, wait dude, to make phone I mean, calls. It's, you know, and I've, I was doing it even before I found out where I placed on the promotional list, but leading up to it, I started looking at a lot of leadership leadership books, listening to leadership podcasts, you know, people that have done things and, you know, there's a lot to be said for getting out of people's way and putting them in positions to succeed and not holding their hand. However, some people need their hand held. But a good leader is you're going to have to figure that out. You know, I'm not going to hold your hand because I know you know better. 
You know something too interesting. I, I'm interested to see too, because you're, you're very diligent in your preparation for, for becoming a leader. We were actually talking about this at the station just last night, like how leading, being able to lead a crew, is different than leading your crew mm-hmm. for, from the firehouse perspective. Or, or you know, it's also applicable to like a charge nurse or a sergeant in a sector in a police department. Like, you can be a great leader. You, you can know everything there is to know. You can read. You can practice. And you can have experience. But it, it's so different from the people you're in charge of. You know, like leading leading a crew on one pumper may be different than a truck. It's just it's all about the crew dynamic and how oh, you it can. absolutely is. And so that's what I'm interested to see. A, a for you uh-huh. and B even for myself later, like how I learned to de- develop to be a leader, but then how I develop to be a leader of those I'm around. I, I'm I'm looking forward to it myself. I think yeah. it'll be a good. Well, good personal growth. And that's why take it back to what Greg was talking about is you have to know your people, you know, you have to know, okay, Chris is good at this. James is good at this. So why am I trying to make Chris do what James is good at and make James do what Chris is good at? Set your people up for success. Now that's not to say that, Hey, Chris, you don't need extra training here. And, to bring up your proficiency and vice versa, but you have to know what your people's strengths and weaknesses are. I agree. It's kind of like when you and I breach a door. Yes. We know what we're doing. I hold the Halligan and he hits it. (laughs) It's a one hit. (laughs) (laughs) So, but we learned that from working together for as long as we worked Mm -hmm. together and we worked it out. So could we do it the other way? Yeah. Yeah. It would get open, but we got a system. Yeah. And if the system is not broken, don't more, try to more fix efficient it. that way. Yeah. And we do less damage. Yep. So. Not every door was one hit, but most of them were. For, the, for the purpose of the story. No, well, most of them really <laughs> no. were. That's the thing. That's, yeah. It's all about how you place it. it. I mean, and having a good swing on it. But yeah, if you say, place it right, I used to say every door was a white kick door until I found a double dead bullet door, and I was like, "Oh, oh, dude!" <laughs> or when somebody kicks a metal door. Uh, yes, <laughs> don't kick the end. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. I thought I really thought someone put like a firecracker in my knee and just lit it. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god!" So work smarter, not harder. We have tools for a reason. Kicking doors should be something done. It's so fun. As a last, last, last I resort. Like I don't like kicking doors. No. I've kicked a few, and I don't enjoy it. The very first time I did, they're like, hey, kick this door. I'm like, okay. You know, I was brand new, and I kicked it and blasted it open, and they're like, all right, now we got to fix it. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's going to take forever. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you learn? <laughs> Consequence, <laughs> bus. <laughs> I'm going to tell, tell you something I learned a long time ago. Try before you pry. That's the truth. I've almost done it once. I'm guilty of it. Like, hey, man, did you check that door? Yeah, it wasn't hot. No, no, check the handle. No. Oh. <laughs> but it was, it, I'll say this, it was so close, the foot was like in motion to the door when someone was like, boop, which then I fell forward. <laughs> Because I had nothing to make contact with as uh, I was kicking us. And that hurt too. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's just a jerk move. So Jeremy did that to you, didn't he? That's a Jeremy move right there. I didn't nice. do that. <laughs> the only thing I ever did to him was give him the nozzle at a fire. An hour later I was covered in peanut butter and burnt. But you know. Hey. <laughs> We're still trying to figure out the yeah. details. <laughs> I still try oh, to piece it together. I wish I had a video of that. Like, I don't even know how that's possible because it was a perfect line. Like, it wasn't like, you know, oh, you got some over here and some over there. and it's can't. No, it was a perfect that was, midline, just this you side. You want to talk about Jeremy's leadership? Let's just, let's just break this down, right? <laughs> he was captain for a day, and he had his driver hurt, a firefighter burnt, and covered peanut butter. Like, oh, and it, I broke my phone. And it broke, like, it was, it was like, yeah, you're going to be an awesome if, if, you, yeah, if you look back at the whole day, it's like, no. Dude, that was not as successful. These day. are the people that get promoted. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Oh, man, that was. 
I still laugh about that day every day I think about it. My guess is the peanut, whole peanut butter thing was it got hot. It tipped over. And he just happened to stand right there to put the fire out. And it was a perfect straight line because he didn't move. Uh, yeah. And that's why his pass alarm was going off. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. See what I did there? Yeah. I like it. All right. Well, I think we can end it on that story. <laughs> Has anybody else got anything? Be safe. Watch peanut butter. <laughs> Are we taking peanut butter with us on the motorcycle trip? Oh, God. I hate you. Oh, God. <laughs> we'll take Nutella for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. If you guys are having a problem or struggling, reach out. Um, there are resources out there. So thanks for stopping by. Have a good one.